Hi, this is Corey McCarthy, and welcome to a new episode of Fit, Formidable, and Fantastic. That's right. Go F yourself, and happy Friday. In this episode, I want to touch on a subject um, that is physique and performance and strength related. Uh, something that, to some people, is a sore subject. To some, they may not really care. They just go about their business anyway. And to some, it's a bragging right. And that is genetic, um, people who are genetically disposed to, uh, being able to grow more muscle, be stronger. Basically, they're the genetically, the genetic elite. And in this episode, I want to touch on something specific related to this. Now, bear with me. There's going to be, um, I'm going to be going through some notes like I usually do. Um, so it, there might be a bit of lag here or there, but something I want to put out there before I even start here is that I'm doing something different in this episode. Instead of directing people to pop up URLs that appear at the top of the screen, which I've come to find not everyone's browser is able to view, I'm going to put all of the research uh, references down below um, in the summary field of this video. So just look down below right above the comments, and uh, you might have to expand it to see it, uh, which will make it easier for you to go to those specific uh, links as well because they can be URLs there, which I cannot seem to embed in videos. But anyway, I just wanted to let you know that ahead of time. So um, you'll find all the research below that relates to what I'm going to discuss in this ep episode and episodes going forward. So that being said, on to the bulk of this episode. Uh, research has shown that there are three important proteins that uh, play a significant role in muscle growth. Um, people who exhibit high responsiveness to training stimuli resulting in muscular and strength development tend to genetically have specific levels of these proteins. And this has been based on a study on older adults. And now, where that's significant, you may say, what about healthy young adults? But older adults um, is because you tend to see muscle wasting in older adults. People, their hormones declining, their muscles uh, basically decreasing and all of that. So this is actually really important to note. Um, and you may have heard of a couple of these, but there's one likely you haven't. So let me jump right into this. The first of the three proteins that I'm going to be addressing are cytokines. Um, basically, that's a protein release in response to injury. Now, specifically, the cytokine that I'm going to be talking about here is IL-6 or interleukin-6. Um, and it has been shown to enhance protein synthesis, and it plays an important role in hypertrophy, and uh, it exhibits growth factor abilities like increasing insulin uh, secretions. Another of these proteins is uh, myostatin, which is uh, one I'm sure that within recent years people are becoming more and more familiar with. Basically, that's a protein that inhibits muscle growth uh, via a process known as myogenesis. And thus, it and thus, if you inhibit this particular protein, you uh, may allow for larger musculature. So when you look at individuals or animals, for instance, that are myostatin, have myostatin inhibitors, basically, who have low myostatin levels, they tend to be have abnormal muscle growth compared to uh, an average uh, person or animal of that species. Uh, a third one that it plays a very important role is um, IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1. And that is a protein that plays a role in regulating muscle mass during development, but it continues to have an anabolic effect in adults. Um, now, basically, what as I was saying, people who are genetically gifted tend to have specific levels of those three proteins, as noted in research. Um, and they think these play a significant role in why some, some people are able to develop faster mass, better strength than the average person. So, you might be asking, how, I'm an average person, um, and how, can, how does this help me? Well, you can't sidestep genetics, but there are some things that I've researched that are potential ways to circumvent or to... Um, in the case of some of these, to increase their presence, thereby, you could say, enhancing your own genetics, whatever you were genetically gifted with at birth. Uh, now we're going to go down these one by one. Let's start out with IL-6, IL interleukin-6. Uh, it has been shown that eccentric exercise leads to, a, to greater increases in IL-6 than concentric, and this is by about 40 to 50%. 
It has also been shown that vitamin C and vitamin E intake can reduce IL-6. So these are things that are important to note. Um, on to myostatin, um, vitamin D intake uh, leads to an increase in folostatin, uh, which leads to a subsequent decrease in myostatin activity, uh, based on some research. Furthermore, low-intensity aerobic exercise has been shown to decrease myostatin levels by 37%. Now, this is in the rodent model, but it's interesting to note nonetheless. And one you're all probably familiar with because it's been getting a lot of hype with the whole myostatin craze of the last few years is oral creatine supplementation combined with training has been shown to reduce myostatin levels significantly in healthy male subjects. And this was when they were following a three-day per week training protocol using a three sets of eight to ten rep scheme for the course of eight weeks. Um... Moving forward now to IGF-1, it has been shown in research that uh, vitamin D intake of 7,000 IU per week versus 5,000 IU increased circulating IGF-1 levels in adults. Furthermore, a rich diet in essential amino acids, um, animal-based or soy, may actually increase IGF-1 levels. And furthermore, resistance training in the 10 rep range has been shown to increase IGF-1 levels in women. So what can you conclude from all this, this research uh, on, on these ways to enhance or, or decrease, where necessary, of these particular proteins so you can benefit from them? Well, let's wrap it up here. Well, I want to emphasize again that genetics play a big role, the biggest role, really. Um, and you can't escape your genetics, uh, aside from maybe potentially using drugs. But even then, the drugs will only... Um, go so far. You still have to train us to eat properly. And even then, somebody with better genetics using drugs versus somebody with poor genetics using the same drugs are obviously, the people with better genetics are still going to get better results. So you can't really circumvent your genetics, so to speak. You are who you are, born the way you are. But you can improve your, potentially improve the outcome of your training. Get the most out of it, of your training, diet, and, and rest, of course. And um, basically, here are some tips that I would conclude from the research above. And uh, that is to limit or avoid vitamin C and E intake directly after your resistance training. So don't take vitamin C and E with your post-workout shake. And I would maybe even skip out on vitamin C and E if you supplement it or, uh, you know, foods that are really rich in those vitamins um, with a meal, you know, the next meal after your protein shake, within the hour or two after your protein shake. Give your body a chance, basically, um, you know, for, to, uh, to adapt to that training uh, without consuming vitamin C and E directly. I would also recommend you supplement 7,000 IU of vitamin D per week per this study. Now, now I also wanted to, to point out here that, of course, I'm not a doctor, so if you have any conditions that this, these would not be conducive for you to be uh, partaking in, of course, speak to your doctor before engaging in any of this, obviously. I'm just going by the research here. I would also say suggest, suggest that you supplement with creatine, which is a well-researched supplement in both effectiveness and safety. Furthermore, I would, I would, I would also recommend you consume a protein-rich diet for your goals to ensure you get ample intake of all the essential amino acids. Also, I would suggest you engage in resistance training in the 8 to 10 rep range at least three days per week. I would also suggest you employ eccentric training in your resistance protocol. And examples of this would be ultra slow negatives on each rep or forced reps beyond failure where you resist the negative yourself and a partner just a partner or your other hand if you or their other uh, side if you're training unilaterally and alone, would allow you to uh, have an assisted concentric, but then you resist the eccentric. Um, and then finally, I would suggest you employ some form of low-intensity aerobic activity, such as jogging, swimming, cycling, walking, um, even perhaps after your resistance training. So um, I think these are all things that... Um, would help you on your endeavors. And like I said, once again, and I want to emphasize this, this isn't going to work miracles here. These are natural methods. These aren't, 
you know, drug related, um, you know, you're not uh, doing anything exogenously really except, you know, vitamin supplementation, creatine. Um, but these are natural things you can do that will not get you banned from a, uh, a physique competition or a powerlifting event, to my knowledge. Um, and these will help you work with what genetics you have to basically help make the most out of your training, your diet, and your, uh, your goals, essentially. Um, now, let me know if you have any questions, you want to discuss any of this further, or if you need some clarification. Uh, put them all in the comments below, anything you want to have to say or ask, as always. Um, but otherwise, uh, have a good weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday for a regularly scheduled episode. Stay fit, stay formidable, and stay fantastic. Take care.